people today, the most significant competition that you may face may not even come from your industry. So to illustrate, uh, the Wall Street Journal last year did some research looking at the variation in household spending in it by Americans from 2007, when the iPhone was first commercialized and Android was first released, to 2012, when this piece of research was published. And what they found was that the average spending on telecommunications by the typical American household up 11%. What was down? Spending on apparel spending on restaurants, spending on automotive, spending on uh, travel. So if you're you know, a car maker and you're benchmarking yourself against other car makers and you're sort of very carefully analyzing other car makers, you're going to miss the plot line completely because the real competition is whatever else that household spending is being drawn into. So I think increasingly in strategy, we're going to have to be looking at a concept that I call arenas, which are pots of resources that, that are going to be contested by players from all different kinds of industries. And part of the skill, I think, of the strategist is going to be spelling out what arenas you're contesting and knowing who the other players are that are trying to draw on those resources. I think it's a really different way of thinking about where we meet competition. What is competition? It's going to be a really different uh, thing. And this suggests to me that we have a really new playbook for strategy. You know what's different. Um, so some of the research that went behind this was I studied a lot of firms that were trying to um, cope with very dynamic markets and looked at what they did and tried to understand um, what were some of the things they did differently than perhaps a more traditional firm that we might study. You know, back in the days, Crown, Cork, and Seal, and you know, companies like that. So the first thing that I'd say was really different was you didn't see a lot of drama. You didn't see major restructurings. You didn't see sort of fire the left-hand side of the building kind of stuff. What you saw instead was what I'll call continuous reconfiguration. Lots and lots of small changes that over time add up to something fairly substantial. So as an example, one of the companies I studied is a company called FactSet. They are a B2B company that sells um, information to uh, investors and to the investment community. And they literally got their start in the 1970s producing a physical book called The Fact Set. And that's where they got their name. Uh, and that was in the 1970s. Well, if you look at them today, they're in databases, they're in the cloud, they run special analytics, they do big data analysis, they um, have all kinds of uh, very advanced electronic functions. So in the space of, what, 30 years, massive change in what they do and who they serve and how they present. But it didn't happen in a great big whoosh, you know. Lots of changes over time as their leaders said, we need to be looking at this, we need to be pushing that envelope, we need to be stepping forward. So this notion of continuous reconfiguration is really different. And it's really different than what you saw, uh, what you see in, in, in traditional strategy where one of the models is what we call punctuated equilibrium, right? So everything goes crazy, then things settle down, then there's a period of stability until the next sort of interruption. And what I think we're starting to look at now is how do we continually adjust so we don't get into this mode where we have a crisis and then have to respond.